Today's panel is from the United States Army, with a focus on the Army Corps of Engineers. Our panelists in this session are Tommy Marks, Director of the Army Office of Small Business Programs out of the Pentagon, Malia Krauss, the Assistant Director in the Office of Small Business Programs for the Army Corps of Engineers, supporting the Southwestern Division out of Texas, and Carla Babb, a small business professional for the Army Corps of Engineers out of the St. Louis District supporting the Great Lakes and Ohio River and Mississippi River Division. Now this panel also has the distinction of being our first panel. Uh, I very much appreciate the hoops and hurdles they went through as we got this organized and delivered to you. Uh, while in the future panels we were kind enough to give them questions ahead of time, this particular panel had no real idea what to expect beyond, hey, what's going on in FY19? So I very much appreciate them um, stepping up to the plate, as it were. But the professionals they are and their expertise on the topic made this a great panel with a lot of useful information for small businesses out there. Sit back and let's get started with this session. Okay, great. Now as we move into um, the three frameworks of our uh, panel session here, um, I wanted to start with FY19 mission priorities. Uh, one of the things we're always told as small businesses is, is that we should um, go off and do our homework. You know, we should go into the Army and do our homework. And uh, we believe in that. We grew up doing our homework. But as a small business, it's a lot harder to do your homework when typically it's the owner who's doing it. And so we try to streamline that by this panel. Um, and one of the ways is understanding uh, priorities. Um, and I describe that just for the, the listener who's listening to this panel. I describe that as... Uh, something a little more specific to the fiscal year coming up, FY19, compared to the Army's broader mission or the Corps' broader mission. Um, so, you know, as we move forward, and, and maybe, Tommy, I can start with you, that uh, from an Army perspective, um, what are some of the mission priorities, even just top one or two priorities, uh, we should be paying attention to as small businesses, which will help us make sure we're bringing solutions that answer that mission requirement compared to, you know, random innovation? Right. Well, I will tell you, uh, today in, in the Army, the, the, pro, the priority is based on modernization. It's focused on modernization. So we have to modernize our force across the enterprise. And there are six specific areas that all contractors need to pay attention to, especially small businesses, because there's a, there's a, the modernization is tied also to innovation uh, because of uh, where we know the Army is going to go with our workforce. Uh, so long range precision fires, uh, this is all in FY, the FY19 NDAA and, and you, you kind of led in by saying kind of where do I look? I mean, it doesn't matter what size business you are. What I would tell you in our community costs you no money except to Google the National Defense Authorization Act because that's where all the priorities are put in and the Army's priorities are highlighted there along with other services for that matter. And if you can follow, I mean, you can pull that down, uh, and you'll see where Congress is. You'll see where the Army has asked for money to go against our major missions to include what our Corps of Engineers does from construction to disaster relief, the whole nine yards. And you know, when we get into disaster relief, a lot of that we're supporting FEMA, but we're funded in order to be able to do that mission. Uh, just like they've done the last couple of years with the hurricanes, disasters, both stateside and, and in Puerto Rico. So uh, that that is really the foundation to, to follow. And if a company does that, uh, no matter how small you are, you, you then can pick out of that because uh, you also know they're going to put money on base operations. 70 plus installations. And if you're in the $5 million range, those installations do base ops and they have to maintain those bases and they use a lot of small businesses. And so you see how much money is based in FY19, about $162 billion for base operations is earmarked uh, what we call in our base dollars. And then you've got the rest of the money you hear them talk about is for overseas operations, normally called OCO, where the core does a lot of work overseas with large companies that team with smaller entities in order to help them get the mission done. So um, before I go to you, Carla, just really quick, um, Tommy, just clarifying, you said National Defense Authorization Act? Yes. 
Okay. And so we'll put a link down for that. And then base ops, just uh, clarifying that if I was in Oklahoma, for example, as a small business under five so million dollars. Small business in Oklahoma, you heard of Fort Sill, Oklahoma? Yep. Fort Sill, Oklahoma is a base. So when we talk base ops, it is the the operation and maintenance dollars set aside in order for Fort Sill to operate and do its school mission. You know, the mini city that it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Inside of Lorton, uh, Lorton Oklahoma, uh, in and of itself, we've got to maintain all those facilities that, that are there, and there's money earmarked for that. And it, and uh, facility operations is a key portfolio that we track. The core does some of that, but really the installation management command, you can Google them. Yep. They're the ones that run the bases. Uh, and along with the Army Sustainment Command. And those two commands actually get the money that track, you know, hey, grass cutting for something as simple as grass cutting, if you will, to uh, refurbishing minor construction that is done. And a lot of folks don't know this. Our core is responsible for major construction, Milcon dollars. Minor construction, and I think if I, uh, I may have a, the ladies will correct me if I'm wrong. The dollar threshold, I think, is below a uh, hundred thousand dollars, or is one point five million? Then I believe we kick in. Right. So below that, you know, ah, oh, okay. Core's not awarding those contracts. You got like maybe thirty, at least thirty-five contracting offices that that are on these installations. Uh, in fact, every installation has a contracting office. Those guys are running that. Okay, that's perfect. And, and um, thanks for clarifying that because that's uh, some of the stuff that will just go into links that we'll provide people. So, um, Carla, if you, can you expand but more from like you guys were just starting to talk about from a core perspective? Especially on, uh, sorry, yes. uh, priorities as we go into 2019. Yes, so for our district and um, to get a little more specific for St. Louis, um, for the core, because our work is based on supplemental, uh, a lot of it's supplemental money, uh, which is through the Bipartisan Act, uh, Budget Act of 2018. So we had got um, supplemental money and Corps of Engineers worldwide, our nationwide, it got like 17 billion of that funding. And so for our priorities for FY19 is a lot of construction. And as Tommy mentioned, um, that has to do with that emergency requirements of the hurricanes um, that had happened in FY17. Um, so a lot of the geographical work is in the Gulf Coast and Puerto Rico. Um, now we do have some operational uh, funding like on our lakes and things like that, but our priorities are gonna be based on that supplemental work um, from those disasters um, that will, um, the contractors can be looking forward to on anticipated requirements for the FY19. What, um, uh, Malia, as we move forward into FY19, and I don't know if this is a hard question, but what percentage typically is unexpected work? Is, you know, like you were talking about disasters or something else, and what if, what um, type of work or, or mission priorities are just really planned out? Well, you can't, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, and what we do is we try to plan as it relates to the, to the disasters. I mean, I think we had at least three disasters happen that we were not prepared for. We also have to run with the budget. If the budget's signed or if it's not, it's all in anticipation of what we think we might get. And some of it sometimes doesn't come to fruition. Other times we get more than we even thought of, especially at the end of the year um, when our customers suddenly get their end of the year money and they need the requirements done immediately. So sometimes that, it, that's, again, that's even, that's fluid. So what I would like to say is, is bottom line is, you know, you say it's so dynamic that they're very fluid right now. And then thus your opportunities are fluid. When it comes, it, it, oh, sorry. The, if, so, so our core, the uniqueness of the core is this. You know, they have two missions. They have a civil works mission and they have a military mission. And so as you, as Carla and Malia are talking about, the deal is they're, they're, for lack of a better term, their standard budget to do, you know, their mission requirements kind of focus on the military side of the house. Civil works, they, they work on a, what we call a working capital fund. And that means they got customers that bring business to them 
And if those customers don't bring business, there is no money there. So when you start talking about planning for disasters, one of their major customers is FEMA, mm -hmm. right? FEMA is really the lead for disaster relief in the United States and its territories. Mm -hmm. But our core has a mission to support them, just like we have a mission to support the VA, especially like, you know, where Carla is, you start talking about certain projects. Uh, you, may, uh, know, you may know that several years ago, uh, Congress mandated that major construction, the VA was doing their own construction. That mm -hmm. is now done by the Corps of Engineers. But that money is budgeted through the VA and the Corps to support to do those VA hospitals that, that, that we're now building with the, uh, through the Corps of Engineers. Yeah, no, that's funny. I was doing um, VA stuff, IT project management, but for construction 10 years ago with the VA. Um, and it always kind of amazed me that they were in the construction business uh, as a, as medical experts, but um, okay. And then the last question I had, or, you know, a uh, range of questions here is around, um, we're talking about the core, but it, it, armies just for a second, because a base seems to be one of the most easy places uh, somebody in a state, for example, could start trying to find um, new opportunities. How does, uh, what, I guess first question is, do bases even have their own mission priorities? The way, you know, how sometimes you have the, the department level priorities and then things kind of flow down and okay, at this level we have these priorities. Um, is there a way for us to learn in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for example, do they have priorities going into FY19 that they're trying to achieve or do they just mimic uh, the department? They do. And so the way the Army is set up, okay, they, it really is decentralized execution in the Army. So each of those installations, though they belong to the Installation Management Command out of San Antonio, Texas, the bases are run by equivalent to a city manager. Okay. Our garrison commanders, which is normally an 06, in, a full colonel in uniform, right, uh, is running that base on behalf of the Army and his, his commander. They put out their own, uh, their own priorities because each base is different. I mean, their, their needs for maintenance is different. It's not a cookie cutter. Uh, you know, some bases are, are, have better facilities than others, or I should say younger facilities. So the older those facilities are, the more maintenance uh, has to be done to them. And we've done a lot of deferred maintenance. That means putting it on hold because of uh, the budget. And so, you know, when you do that, stuff is not getting better. It's just getting worse. So those commanders have that. And, and what a small business can do, they can go to, for example, here in our area, Fort Belvoir, Fort Myers, a small business can contact the, uh, the contracting office there, and they can tell them what, what they're buying and what they're looking for. Uh, we, we have small business specialists just like Carla and, and Malia around the country. The bases have some of those too. Uh, and small businesses, can, they can go to, in fact, so my website, the Army website is www.osbp.mil. Brand new, reactivated 20 July. Uh, ah, good. So, so they can go to that, and we have some forecast data there. Uh, now, the data is good as you see it when you look at it, right, because it has to be updated. But we have links to the four major buying commands. So my two teammates on the screen belong to the Corps of Engineers. That is one of the major buying commands. Corps' primary mission, from an Army perspective, is construction, but they also have some places where they have installations where they do, they have installation uh requirements to take care of where they're, they're, they're located. The, the Army Material Command has most of the bases uh, and they do they work through um, the Army Sustainment Command out of Rock Island, but those individual bases across the United States like Fort Sill, Fort Bragg, uh, pretty much a lot of the states, the active duty bases, right? There's also just a tip, the Army Reserve has bases. They have contracting requirements. They have a budget and they have priorities. And you can go to those bases and talk to those folks. If you live in that community and you're not doing that, I would tell you you need to go establish a relationship, uh, especially if you're an 8A company. Because here we are now, and the two of them will back this up. We're in the fourth quarter of the year. We only got 60 days left. Most of the money, because we want a continuing resolution, 
throughout this FY is just now starting to flow and the requirements that we have are trying to be put on contract. They will be working until midnight, 30 September. If you're an 8A company and you've got, you got capabilities that we can use because of the 8A uh, rules, some direct awards will clearly be made like we've done in the past. And if you got an 8A company that's ready to go and the contracting office knows about it, you know, they're going to do all the due diligence and the proper paperwork, but you can get direct awards are going to be, uh, are going to be given, uh, awarded based on, on need. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And, and it's, you touched into a question I think a lot of people will latch on to over the next few weeks of, you know, this, this recording will be relevant for a long time, but the part you just said really hits onto what people are asking. Hey, is there any end of the year money? Oh yeah, there's, there's always end of the year money. There just might not be $200 million contracts. Um, right. But so well, uh, there is plenty end of the year money. Yeah. Uh, one of our, our toughest challenges across the federal government, but especially in the army has been able to make our, our hub zone, hub zone goal. Yeah. Uh, and not because uh, we don't have requirements. The challenge has been finding hub zone companies that are hub zone certified that have the capability to meet the mission requirements. Yeah, we're, um, we're really pushing on it, and I can talk to you another time about it, but we do hub zone set-aside calls every single day now, trying to do exactly that, is to get companies together and say, look, you need to provide quality responses to a source of thought, and right. that'll give the government the rationale to set it aside. Otherwise, uh, you know, you just point fingers for no reason. Um, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move us on to our second phase, but um, thank you for, uh, by the way, reminding me of the garrison commander. When I was in the army, I worked for the garrison commander and saw them going out, and that's going to be a massive tip I, I, I put out there separate from the video is that's a great way to do it is to start, you know, trying to get the garrison commander more engaged if they're not already with like PTACs and some of these events that are out there. So thank you. I can tell you in, in FY19 NDAA, they're pushing more down to the garrison commander without him, him he or she having to come up uh, above them to get approvals to execute their duties and what they need done. I love the fact that we're recording this because in 15 minutes, you guys have just dropped more tips than I think I've heard in the last 60 days or something. This stuff is exactly what I was hoping to get. Um, so let's slide into procurement trends. Excuse me. Um, one of the challenges with small businesses is trying to figure out how can we win a contract. Now, my personal advice to small businesses that are under $5 million is you should consider just subcontracting always. You know, it's way easier. You don't have the administration and you can build a really successful company money-wise um, while learning the government business, while building relationships, getting past performances that are, are as a sub, but you're cutting your teeth. Um, but still, there's work out there for those uh, companies that have been around for a while or who are trying to get primes. And I'm, I, I'd like to try in the next you know, 15 minutes or so, talk about um, these three levels of procurement that I'm looking at at the moment. One is below 25,000. The reason I say that is because uh, theoretically when it hits 25,000, it has to go in FBO. So what happens to the stuff that's below 25,000? Like, am I able to get into Fort Sill and, and show them I can do it for less than 25,000 and maybe they just don't even have to put it out? That's one thing. And then this, the second group is the simplified acquisition. And I'm actually not even sure if it's, if the numbers have changed yet, but either way, that simplified acquisition is that twenty five thousand to, you know, one twenty five or two fifty or whatever. And then the last one is uh, procurement vehicles. And so, as a as a small business, if I have none, I'm trying to figure out my maturity as we go through, and um, you know, trying to figure the steps as as we go up. So, uh, Malia, maybe we'll start with you um, on any one of those three that you feel comfortable. But perhaps maybe the uh, simplified acquisition or the below, below twenty five thousand. How do we get that business as a small, how do, we, how do we go after those? As it relates to the core, um, typically those values are at our lake offices. And because some of them may be remote, um, it typically goes straight small business set aside. That doesn't mean they can't get it, but it's just we have a hard time finding the more restrictive set asides in that area. Um, between um, that simplified and below, now, the, going above that, it's, it's really looking at that market research, and, and typically, I will say, at the end of the fiscal year, when we're trying to execute, we're doing those direct awards. So anything probably under $4 million might go that direction because 
got to think about it. If it's the end of your money, you have to spend it by the end of the year. The regulations do not allow for us to put out, you know, the solicitation for 30 days or the pre-solicitation for 15 and give you another 30 days to put in a proposal. We can't meet that. And so that's the whole point of using those indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type contracts, as well as the 8A direct awards at the end of the year. And um, and as we talk, maybe uh, Carly, you could chat like simplified acquisition. Can you explain that a little bit? And especially in the army or in the court, how how does that work? Like I, I know a lot of us had myths about ah simplified acquisition. Here's a here's an invoice or a quote. I get the money, you get the product or service, and we're done. But it doesn't sound like that's what it is. And maybe you can share a little bit more about that. So the simplified acquisition has changed. It is two fifty now. Um, Based, based on the latest guidance uh, policy that's came out. So for the simplified acquisition, um, we will usually, um, as a core, we'll go out and get, uh, we can get up to three quotes. Um, and one of the things here at our core, I don't know about other districts, but when uh, contractors come in for capability statements, um, I load the capability statements onto our internal uh, database mm -hmm. and, uh, we can then pull three of those um, contractors' capability statements and then um, ask for quotes. So we can go that way. Um, GSA, again, I know we all talk about vehicles, but GSA is uh, a good way that we go and get, um, you know, uh, contract or proposals for the simplified acquisition um, because of the, it's an easier vehicle to use. Um, and we get a, a, a bigger base of um, competition that way as well. How, when you talk about um, three quotes in there, it, are you able to, uh, like as, as small businesses do some homework and maybe we're finding a requirement, are, are we able to try to encourage that or you know, softly influence that in this idea of, hey, here's two competitors who could also do it, or you know, would you consider putting this out? How, how would you advise us if we're looking at trying to uh, help with simplified acquisition or help drive something towards simplified acquisition? And I don't know if that's an easy question, but. Well, I mean, no, because when we're looking at um, the contractor's capability statement, I mean, we're looking at, you know, does it fit our needs? So we, we need to make sure that, that contractors capability, the small business uh, capability statement has um, that performance work that fits the need of the, the scope of work. So um, it's important that what they're providing on their capability statement has that the, the work that fits the scope. So um, is, is that more in line with what you were asking? Um, does that answer the question that you were answering or asking? Yeah, I mean, um, a little, a little bit. Um, that's as, that's if you were going to look into your database and look at the capability statements to see which three are there. But I'm wondering, like, if I'm happening to talk to a, you know, I do my homework and I know an opportunity is kind of out there with the program office. Um, am I able to? Is there any way to influence it to go simplify acquisition? Or from a small business standpoint, is that really just not our space? And, uh, you know, we're not playing there. Well, uh, oh, wait, Carl. Oh. Oh. <laughs> One of the things it says is basically um, in the simplified acquisition, anything over 250 is reserved exclusively for small business. It does not say that we can't do a more restrictive set aside. And one of the things I think we can do with those type of values is to quickly look at the dynamic small business search. Yeah. And that's how we can find those firms. And we can, as we said, we can actually set it aside, you know, in those more restrictive areas if we want to. You have a lot more flexibility when it's below the, the threshold. The two fifty. Well, yes, we buy. You know, pretty much our major buy is construction. So you know, as soon as it gets in the simplified acquisition threshold, there's a little fuzzy room regarding bonding. But you know, but after it hits one hundred twenty, you have to have those full bonds, and so that's you know that causes the complexity of it. But anything below that, outside of, I think it's. 50 to 100K, you have to have like like a tripart agreement or things of that nature. And anything below that, you don't need a bond. 
Yeah, and, and that's why I tell small businesses, if they're at that certain stage, just go subcontract. <laughs> like, get to that stage, which gets you the money, which then puts you in the position. Um, because Bonnie... We tell, we tell all firms, all small business firms wanting to start out is they need to subcontract, let alone just to understand the paperwork. It's the paperwork that will kill you, not your capability. Right. Yeah, and I'm testament of that. I'm really good at this, the, the sales and the service. It's, it's the operational side. I'm like, ah, somebody else take care of that. Um, let me ask you a question before I move to the IDIQs of the vehicle side. You said lake office. Um, is that like a lower unit or organization for you guys? Well, not every district, but our districts have lake offices, which these lakes are put in place for flood, flood control. So, um, so the result of that, we create recreational areas where, you know, the public can come and, and boat, swim, picnic, things of that nature. Well, those, those areas also require uh, work as well. It could be like just replacing the roof on a shack, it could be screens on a picnic area, replace the electrical um, post for an RV, you know, things like that. Yeah, we, um, I mean, we'll talk about this, I guess, in the market research in a minute, but I push really hard what you guys have been pushing for your entire careers is mm -hmm. core competency meets core. Uh, it doesn't, I, I actually met somebody who has four people and they, their answer was, when I asked, what do you do? Everything. I said, well, let's work on that. Because that's, that's a flag to the government that you do nothing or something. <laughs> or, um, you know, so I, I like this idea when I'm hearing about the lake office and how people can pick up tips from here. It's really, you can be really good at this and they're all over the country or something. And that could be your way to begin to build uh, strength and keep it, or past performance. So, uh, so Tommy, I, I was going to ask you about um, one of the challenges for small businesses, especially as we're starting off, we have no vehicles, is what's, what is our maturity path of contract vehicles? We all hear about GSA. We hear about three terms, GSA, IDIQs, and GUX. And um, generally, we're completely confused and have glass eyes when we're hearing it. Um, and we try to hang with the conversation. And then most of us latch on to GSA. You got to have a GSA schedule. Um, what, especially from the Army's uh, perspective, um, what are the trends going out there? And um, what are the ones we need to be paying attention to from, from an early level maturity? Not, not everybody out there, but like for these early one, two, three, three vehicles kind of thing to start moving forward. Well, I would tell you the first thing that uh, from, from a uh, developing a strategy for a company, they got to decide what they want to go after. And if you're going to play in, when you're going to, when you're going to play in the arena where we're still now talking about contracting vehicles, then uh, I would submit to you that probably the first thing you want to look at is subcontracting opportunities. And you come to the table with your know-how and what, and, and what you believe the value you can bring I think you got to get on some vehicle and on best starts is really a subcontract. And that's teaming with those folks. And obviously you won't learn that unless you go into outreach events and those folks are actually looking. I mean, we, we, in fact, in October, every October for the last five years, we hold a small business forum in DC with the Association United States Army. And we have a two and a half day, uh, two day to two and a half day focus strictly on small businesses networking with not only just small businesses, but with other than smalls so that folks can, can uh, understand how possibly to get started. The, the, I mean, the tool that, that uh, there is really no um, school book solution on what vehicle you ought to be on. But if you're gonna be in the, get in the arena to play, uh, GSA schedules are key vehicles that if you get one, you're able to come to the field of play. Does that mean you're gonna win a contract? Because I will tell you, I'm told by small business, you know, I'm on GSA schedule 70, and you know, I hadn't gotten an award yet. Well, just getting on the schedule is one thing, but then you gotta be be able to compete when you're on the schedule. And uh, because you're gonna compete uh, uh, in the arena with other small businesses that, uh, as you talked about, they got that 20%, that 80%. And uh, those schedules, are, are, are really valuable, especially at the end of the year, because as a contracting officer, and you know, I've said in that seat before, you don't have to, you know, you now you can kind of vet 
when you down to September the 15th and Miss Call is saying, Tommy, we got to get that. We got this new requirement came in and we got to get it on contract. The first thing we're going to really start looking at is things that are already in place because you don't have time to build up, you know, that whole acquisition and put a vehicle in place. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I tell um, people when I'm talking with them that uh, GSA schedule or any of these vehicles is like having a restaurant. You've got a menu now, but it doesn't give you any customers coming through the door. You still have to somehow attract them in. Um, so uh, I liked a, a tip you provided there that was um, really dead on about you have to figure out what you want. You know, what, the, um, what do you want to go after? What do you sell? What do you do? And this goes back to uh, uh, with Malia, the core competency how do I find the current vehicle? And I actually kind of know this, but I mean, how do I find the current vehicle as a small that's being used for the type of work I want? Like, let's say lake, lake work or construction, you know, IT. Well, IT is too broad at the moment, but, you well, know. Well, actually, yeah. so, well, actually and, I, and I think, uh, you know, my colleagues will, will, uh, will help me out if I, if I stray the wrong way. Just like, I said in the beginning, if you want to know what the Army requirements are from one year to the next, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, because that's how the Army builds its budget, and that's inputted through the Department of Defense that, the, that goes to the President's desk that goes over to the Hill, right? So FPDSNG, the F Federal Procurement Database, in my own job, you know, I got a guy that can go in a database and tell me what's in there. Yeah. I had a job previous to this one. The first day on the job, I asked folks to tell me what our forecast requirements are because I was in charge of all services for the Army. And they couldn't tell me. And these, these, these are my folks working for me in the, on the, my side of the fence. I said, so has anybody went to the database? Well, you know, no. Well, guess what? FPSMG, is, as bad as some people might think it is, you know, we input the data. So, you know that, that old saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? So the data in FPDSNG is the source data that we have for all contracts. Every contract has a beginning and an end date. And if I didn't know anything else, and oh, by the way, FPDSNG has a public facing window portal that anybody can go to, you just got to sign up. And I don't think it costs any money. And then they can, they can peruse FPDSNG. What will you find? Contract X. They tell you place of performance. It tells you if they put the right data in, right? It will tell you when it began and when it ended. So if I got one that's in most of our contracts today are one year base with four option years, that's kind of the, the, the standard. So you know you got a five year window. Now the government, you, you would expect we're gonna exercise those options because we have a requirement we still have. If that's the case, and we're in year three on that contract, I'm looking at what they're buying. Oh, by the way, I can start doing some planning on when that thing's gonna go back out. And oh, by the, it also tells you whether who was it awarded to, you know, small business or other small business. Small business set aside, woman-owned small business set aside. It tells you all that stuff in FPS. It's so a gold mine. Now people kind of say, oh, you know, the, the data's bad in it. Well, guess what? It's it's what we have to date, and I. I put, you know, 80% accuracy on it because that's what we, most of our requirements in the Army today, and I want to get off a soapbox, get on a soapbox, are reoccurring requirements that support, especially the installation type stuff. Like Malia was saying about, you know, the, the, the lakes that we have. Those lakes that we build in order to do flood control become re recreation centers the best in the world, and they got to be maintained. Guess what? You can find in every contract we do, you know, pretty much you can go to FPDSNG, other than the credit card uh, mm -hmm. we do, if it's, if it's under the, 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 term, the, the three categories you talked about, it's on FPDSNG. Mm -hmm. hey, let me go. Sorry, go spend is another. Uh, platform as well. Is that different than USA dot, uh, uh, USA .gov or something? Is There's one out there that's kind of like that that shows a lot. Is this a different? Neil? Yeah. Um, 
everything of all those uh, sites out there, it all pulls from FPDS and G. Um, okay. And as uh, Tommy stole my thunder, uh, let me give you two examples um, of what he's talking about. FPDS and G can be your friend. It tells you how the core is buying this stuff. For example, um, just say if there's IT firms out there, okay? We get a lot of emails from IT firms, but the thing is, it's, you gotta do the homework. You got to be able to figure out how we buy it. The core of engineers does not do the procuring of IT services. We have a separate contractor who has a, who has a, a small business liaison officer, so therefore we have to go send the small business to them. Or another, uh, like say hard drive, uh, hard hardware information or hardware, we have to. You say it has to utilize a contract called Chess. Okay, that's a mandatory source. So every time hardware comes up, they're calling us, and it's like, well, we use Chess. So if you find that out, you can go straight to Army and start doing it. It's all about you know targeting your market strategically. Well, I think. Um uh, one of the big takes away, takeaways from the, like the procurement side really comes down to FPDS because um, I'm asking these questions, but you're right. I, I've used it myself. Even when I just started a, a new company, the very first thing I did is went and found other companies that are hub zone companies that do what I want to do because I didn't want to prime. I wanted to sub. I found 71 of them and reached out to them and said, hey, I do this. I would like to be a really good subcontractor to build my past performance. And 15 of them got back to me with, uh, yeah, no, we'd love to sit there and talk and help. And three or four of them were actually really current opportunities I could help with. They actually went faster than I was ready for, but um, it was great. And, and uh, so that let's take that as a great takeaway. Um, I'm going to move into the next phase, which uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Because um, I think we, the procurement kind of slides into marketing naturally anyways, because it, it goes back to research. But um, one of the things I'd like to describe, and I might have said this in the beginning, but um, Wayne Gretzky, old hockey pro, talks about don't skate to where the puck is, skate to where the puck's going to be. And in market research, uh, I try to teach small businesses that same thing, is find out where the government's looking and be there so that when they look, you're there. Uh, so my question, uh, I guess, Carla, going in, starting with you, is when, when uh, you start doing market research, where do you go? Like, what's, what's the top one, two spots you go, or how do you do market research? By the way, um, separate from what you said earlier about your own database of capability statements. Make you work harder at that. Yeah. Um, well, small business dynamic search would be the first um, avenue. And um, so it's important that small businesses have that description filled out. Um, otherwise, we don't know what they're capable of without filling out that description um, in, a, in good detail. And we find that small businesses don't always do that. So it's important that they're filling out that description. Uh, your local PTAC. Um, I've used the, the PTAC myself to go and find um, contractors, a pool of contractors for particular NAICs where like we also have uh, lakes um, for requirements that we have needs for. And since they are in rural areas, um, I've, I've used the, the PTAX to find a pool of contractors um, for those requirements. Um, so those are two ways that um, we use market research. Um, so that's, that's a, a good way for small businesses to, um, you know, to open up for small businesses for market research. On the uh, DSBS, and you're right, I just um, did a Department of Energy talk last week, and 60% of the people, we did this analysis report for them, 60% of them got a failing grade, which they loved because it showed them what was wrong, and it was simple things like missing keywords or only three NAICs when they really probably could have more, and, um, and, and we find that across the board. When you go in, though, is it typically uh, you start off with the NAICs and keyword search, and then you're looking at the, the narrative? And, and if, if that's the part right. you about the description, what do you look for in that description? Because I'm always curious like, uh, on what people's advice are or what they're looking to see there. 
Well, we're going to look for what our needs are based on the, the project that or the requirement that we're procuring. So if it's construction and it's like one of our lakes, we're looking to uh, put some pavement down on on the road. Um, we're going to look for, you know, concrete work. Um, so they, they need to have that they've done concrete work. Um, so they need to have that in their description. Okay, good. Uh, so on their core competencies to make sure they're right, right. Those salient characteristics in the requirement; those are important. Okay, good. And then, uh, uh, Malia, same thing with you from a market research. Uh, you know, especially maybe if we touch on sources sought. Uh, uh, the sources sought come out through FBO. A lot of these RFIs. What do you guys tend to look for in responses that are coming back? How can we, how can we, how can we write better quality responses? And how can we um, talk to some of our concerns? Well, one of the things I would say is, are we providing the industry a quality source of thought? Mm. Uh, one of the things that um, should not cost a firm, if we issued something that was just shy of a proposal, we should be asking, and typically with the Corps of Engineers, I can speak within my division, its name, number, all that, you know, give us at least three projects that meet the scope of work and just the information. You know, there's three or four questions and, and all you need to do is concentrate specifically on those questions. You don't have to submit, you know, the fluff of anything. Just answer those questions. Um, not only did, as, as Carla mentioned, the dynamic, but we also pull FPDS. We want to see what other small businesses have performed work before just in case we didn't grab them all from the source of thought or the dynamic. Uh, sometimes they will perform a virtual or local industry day specific to the action. But again, all of this is going to be based on the requirement. And another thing would be we also utilize C peers and peepers. What's, which the, is, second, what's the second one? Uh, it's a uh, past performance the actual documented official past performance. We'll utilize that as well. You said CPARS and something else? Like PPARS? PPARS. It's P-P-I-R-S, and they're basically the same thing. Okay. It's yeah. the official past performance. And, and so you just need to be very specific. And going back to the dynamic, you just need to ensure that the NAICS codes that you provide you know, match the narrative capability, which is to match the keywords to match your references. So if you tell me you do environmental and there's nothing in the keywords about environmental and there's nothing in the references regarding environmental, you don't do environmental. Yeah. That's, it's, that's what we're thinking. It's a lot of fun being in this role that I'm in. Um, and, I, and I'm saying this on video, right? But, but I'm totally okay with this, is that I feel like I'm in a position to more do a little tough love head knocking together because as we do daily set-aside calls and I see people coming to our set-aside calls to discuss the source of thought before we even go to the government, I see how unprepared people are coming to us. And rather mm -hmm. than us getting mad, we knock our head together and say, come on, let's, let's get our act together. Um, because uh, we do exactly that. I get people who reach out to me and say, why did you contact me about this opportunity? Because you said in, in DSBS that you do it, um, apparently, ah, oh, we haven't done that in 10 years. Well, perhaps you should stop wasting the government's time by making them even have to look at your profile or something, or your profile uh, going forward. Um, the, the, uh, what about responses? Like as, we, um, as we're writing responses back on an RFI, uh, do you have a couple of tips on um, ways we can make it, uh, and I feel like this is a loaded question, but really demonstrate uh, quality so we make the short list or if we're trying to set aside the hub zone you know we have enough of us who are demonstrating how do we demonstrate quality of our response enough that you say okay let's move forward to the next step um, I'd like to comment I'm sorry I'd like to come on that because what what I see a lot in responses is that um, small businesses want to be an expert at everything and you can't be an expert at everything um, you have to have a primary NAICS code that's required in SAMS. Um, and so try and focus on what the requirement is um, and not make it a huge 10-page um, document on your response. 
um, get it down to what our requirement need is um, when you submit your source of sought response and what you're what you're good at because that's, that's it needs to meet that requirement that we're looking for so that was that's one tidbit that I could add uh, let me give you an example say we're looking for um, firms that can perform um, design build 42,000 square feet two-story medical clinic if you have past performance that specific then that's what you provide what if you don't um, well, you know, in the medical facility, you know, those types of things, you got to, you know, there's, there's an HVAC requirement in there. Mm -hmm. I think we might be more, more heavy on the design bill because you can always provide an A&E to handle that HVAC requirement. Okay. But if you're showing past performance, like two stories, okay, you can get past one story and, and keep the building up, you know, but looking at that design bill capability can help on that HVAC. And, uh, and Tommy, I might actually throw one of the last questions in direction because something uh, Malia just said reminded me of this. A question somebody had asked us ahead of time was along the lines of bundled and unbundled uh, contracts. And, um, and I've done podcasts before with folks talking about, um, you, you know, don't make the contracting officer's job harder by coming in and trying to unbundle naturally bundled things. Like if I need IT support, don't try to pull printer support out and say, hey, let's do this separate because now you're making it inconvenient for the government. But sometimes there seems to maybe be a bundling of not directly related stuff, but you know, just in a bigger contract. Um, what are your thoughts on that from a small business perspective? Like, is that something we should even be tracking on or if we see it just kind of accept it or? Well, f first of all, my office is responsible by statute to review acquisition strategies, uh, especially those over $250 million. Our folks below us are responsible uh, that we look at whether or not a re requirements are being bundled. Bundling is not something that is looked at uh, based on some of the IG reports we've gotten, a good thing to do. Now, what folks have to understand though, and I tell this to companies when I'm on the stoop, is that, you know, Congress has mandated that we look at that acquisition reform is looked at from all, all sides, which includes uh, sometimes we got too many contracts for the same requirement out there. So we're actually looking at that. And so uh, the, in doing so, if those requirements still exist, if there's a better way to do that and, and reduce the number of, of contracts, uh, I know the concern is they're gonna have some, some impacts, but if it's done the right way, you know, we can still take care of folks. Uh, but we can't have a, you know, each command we get once, once they're on contract, when the reality is we should look at those requirements from a holistic standpoint in order to, uh, in order to get the best, you know, the best dollar uh, for the taxpayer. Uh, so, but in my three years in the seat, three plus years in the seat, I've not had any bundling requirements. Uh, we've had some stuff consolidated, right? And, and not many of those. And so what I do is we take a hard look at the small business equities when folks are coming uh, with those types of uh, requests. And um, the, uh, you know, so that, you know, that we, we, we do the right thing. Yeah, and it sounds to me, like I, I was asking the question, um, asked but it's uh um, i do believe in the whole bundling when i worked with the va 150 hospitals or something and i could sell the same thing to each one of them separately because they wouldn't bundle and i was like the loudest advocate to bundle i was like you should not only bundle but you should charge me once or i should charge you once excuse me but until those processes are in place that something built for a base could be used at every military base or something um it's so hard that but that's the innovation i guess I think Malia mentioned about the chess contract. Yeah. Right. So with all the soft hardware and software and stuff that we do uh, in the past, we, everybody had their own contracts and you had all these different prices. But the reality is uh, I would submit to you that the big guys were ones that really make it awkward today on the chess. When we recompeted chess several years ago, we actually have more small businesses on because it, it's, you got a full and open and we had a uh, restricted to small business. We had more small businesses we put on chess than we had other than small businesses. 
So in two, two different suites. But oh, by the way, what happens is in that, in, that, in, in that scenario, a small business was able to compete in the restricted suite for small businesses and in the full and open. And we had small businesses actually win in the full and open competition. So yeah, that's a good it's a delicate balancing act that, that we have to play with uh, clearly our jobs, the three of us, is to ensure that small business is getting a fair opportunity to com compete for the dollars that the government has, that the Army has. And I think we do a real good job of that in the Army. Uh, the last three years, I average about $18.5 billion total uh, each year. And the core uh, has a big chunk of that $18.6 billion, you know, about, uh, close to about uh, six, uh, six billion of that. No, that's awesome. Go ahead. Neil, um, just to clarify a few things, just make sure we use the same terminology. We do overall consolidation. Bundling is a subset of consolidation. Bundling is where it impacts small businesses. Because we can consolidate all day. If it gets set aside, we're good. That's funny. So it's, I guess it's the... Uh, it, and I don't want to dwell on this question. I certainly don't want to end on this question because the yeah. idea of bundling, it's people have these ideas. And one of the things I try to say, especially a uh, uh, hub zone, right? Hub zone chamber. Mm -hmm. I like to say, let's get the $6 billion off the table that's still sitting there every year. And yeah. then start worrying about all these challenges that are out there. Because I don't, I, I think when we begin to look at them, they're not as big as, as maybe might come out. The other thing, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but we now have the ability and I think Tommy was talked about a little bit, was the ability to issue an unrestricted contract with small business reserves. What it means is we can reserve certain projects to small business, but if by chance we have to put the, the unrestricted side, the small business can go after that as well. Now here's the thing. In FBO, there is no checkbox for unrestricted with small business reserve. So it makes it harder for small businesses to find. The only thing I can say right now is I told they're working on it. That was seven years ago. And, sure. and so one of the things is you might have to search by saying reserve and see what pops up because you can have a hub zone reserve. I'm sorry. Can you can you explain this just a little bit more to me? You said you're saying unrestricted. Um, I'm it'll not following issued, what that is. It will be issued as an unrestricted contract, okay. but we can take part of that and make it a small business reserve. I'll give you. Uh, oh, I see. You're saying. I can construction. We found small businesses can do up to 25 million per project. Okay, so anything as an IDIQ, anything below 25, we're going to look to that small business group first. Now, say it was 30 or 35. Well, okay, we've already determined we're going to use the unrestricted. Okay, that doesn't mean these small business firms under the reserve can't go after that. They're just as capable. If they can put a proposal together and submit it and they're capable, they could end up getting the award as well. Um, and just digging that a little bit, are you saying that potentially when you have that reserve that the contract could be split into two awards? Or is no. it for whoever well, wins it? It's one solicitation, two awards, obviously. But, okay, okay. yeah. So, but it's one solicitation, and it's going to hit FBO as, as NA on set-aside. No, that's awesome. And actually, if you're okay with that, I'll follow up with you if I have uh, okay. questions on it. But I, I, I'm going to work with the team to dig into it, because that's exactly the type of stuff we're trying to show is that, for small businesses, again, I'm a big fan of saying stop pointing the finger at the government. There's a lot of things being done. Let's figure out what they are. Let's figure out how to play the game correctly. And um, it's not a trick. You know, the first step is showing up. And even something like what you just said on reserves, I've got 20 years experience. I have no idea what you're even talking about. Like I'm a small business. And so, and, and I don't think that's unusual, right? I think that's more normal than not. And the idea is, okay, how do we spread the word among us small businesses? Because you're putting it out there. You've let us know there's probably been announcements of some sort out there. Um, and what I'm trying to do is get the small businesses to communicate more among ourselves on this kind of activity. But hey, let me, um, so we're ready to wrap up, but I did want to, I know um, you guys have taken some time to prepare some stuff. Um, and I just want to find out if there was anything you had prepared in, in, in preparation for this panel uh, that maybe you wanted to share last minute. 
And, and if not, that's fine. We can move to kind of the last minute. Um, any last minute tips you had on your notes or were you able to get through your notes? The I, I would just, you know, I would just say this that, uh, to the community that if you want to know what we're buying, start with that NDA every year. Uh, Google that is it's free to the public. If you want to, if you want to establish your own forecast and see what we're doing, go to FPDSNG and see what, what's in there. It tells you by command what we're buying and where, where that's being bought. Uh, and those things will help you help a company shape what they want to do. And that's all those dollar values you talked about, Neil, you know, below 25,000, you know, up to the big contracting vehicles. And so, uh, and if you're a new company coming in, you know, think about, I think the other panel members said this, think about subcontracting. Some folks don't want to do subcontracting. They're like, it's, it's, you know, there's some, some taboo about it. Well, you yeah. know, it's still the same green money, Benjamins and all, you know, in subcontracting. And, and that's where, you know, you can learn without uh, having to be the guy in charge of uh, all that government paperwork that's got to take place, as Malia talked about. So, uh, I appreciate being here. Yep. Uh, any last minute thoughts, Carla? Yeah, I, I want to say the same with Tommy. As far as subcontracting opportunities, uh, I know a lot of small businesses don't want to subcontract. They want to be the prime. But what a, what a good way to learn from other um, businesses that have done work with the government, with the core in general, is to subcontract. Um, the money's just the same, and um, you learn about how to do that DOD paperwork as well. Um, check on upcoming laws and regulations, and know your contract. Know what those clauses mean. Those, those can hurt or help uh, small businesses as well. Um, and the last thing I want to leave with is um, maintain a good CPARS rating. It makes a difference um, when it comes to um, the, de the Department of Defense in general. So that's, and I think for the opportunity as well as being a part of this. Thank you. Malia, any last minute comments there? Yeah, I have a little, some statistics, but um, you know, from the core perspective, since about 2012, there's an average of the hub zone set asides, 85% is IDIQ. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Is that good or so is that what I'm telling you is they need to start looking now, probably those that expire in 19 or 20, so they can prepare now to look for a potential source of thought or find out from the small business professional if they're going to recompete it. Um, update your profile, keep it updated so that they're really prepared when the time comes. Um, the other thing is understanding the culture of each district. Figuring out how to get your foot in the door is understanding that. And the first step is to always start with your small business professional. Um, other than that, I, I thank you for the time and this uh, new opportunity that's come about. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you um, all as well. I, uh, I I think you'll know this as we go forward that we're going to be doing a lot more. We have eight more of these lined up that we're doing the recording. And uh, uh, so I appreciate it because the small businesses, and, and I don't know if I've said this to you all, but uh, I just like to share it because this event or you know, this recording is going to be available to all small businesses. Uh, frankly, the largest can come in and learn. Um, but it's uh, it's hosted by the HubZone Chamber of Commerce, and we have members from Guam to U.S. Virgin Island and every single state in between. Um, that has been a priority of ours is to raise the entire tide of all the HubZone companies, not any that just pay us dues or whatever, right? We really wanted to make sure we're touching everybody. And this goes with, Malia, what you just said. It's like get in and get to know your local um, small business professionals or anybody related to that and we move forward. So um, thank you very much for the time. That concludes our panel session. I wanted to again express my deep appreciation to Tommy Marks, Malia Krauss, and Carla Babb for making the time to participate and share their thoughts with you. I would also like to thank your local Procurement Technical Assistance Center out there or PTACS for their support. Many of our panelists are not able to use their own computers and must be hosted at a local PTAC, which involves prep work, coordination, and significant time commitment. If you don't have a relationship with your local PTAC, start today. Procurement is the first word in their name, and they are definitely committed to the success of small businesses. Visit their website, www.aptac-us.org, to find your local PTAC. Again, it's www.aptac-us.org. 
APTAC, as in Association PTAC, dash US dot org, www.aptac dash US dot org. Um, if you're on the HubZone Chamber website watching this video, you should be able to see a link down below as well.